everybody else's mic uh, works. My name is Daniel Webster. I work for a company called Kaltura, uh, but really it's about the people on the panel. Uh, the last uh, session was about the impact of uh, OTT on pay TV, and uh, this is really about monetization of OTT uh, platforms, over-the-top platforms for those people who aren't familiar with all the crazy acronyms which are going around. Uh, and I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves and say uh, what, they're, what they consider the sort of biggest uh, issue around monetization. But first, let's put this in the context of the news which came out this morning. And as everybody who's read a uh, blog or a, a news feed or something knows that uh, Verizon acquired AOL for $4.4 uh, $4 billion. And uh, that's very interesting and ironic and it's a show of the times uh, and it really sort of goes to the heart of what we're talking about the media landscape is dramatically changing uh, all the players are being uh, shaken up and you're having talks of uh, cord cutting cord nevers uh, whether or not that's right you know is something which we're going to sort of uh, discuss uh, and also um, what the economics are of these new models. It's interesting that when the merger between AOL and Time Warner happened back 15 years ago, uh, that was for, I think, one point, no, sorry, 182 billion was the valuation of the two companies. So you can sort of see that there is money being essentially sucked out of uh, the ecosystem. And the question which everybody is facing more so this year than any previous year, is where uh, those new sustainable monetization models come from. Uh, and everybody is sort of experimenting and sort of being forced to uh, play with that. There are some uh, folks like you know, the ABCs of this world who still uh, get a lot of money from uh, the traditional uh, form of distribution. Uh, you know, to the tune of $8 billion in terms of their ESPN, ESPN rights alone. And the question is, as those models begin to sort of fracture as you have this uh, unbundling, rebundling, what are those new monetization models going to look like? And will companies, uh, companies that are sitting here in this room, be able to sort of uh, survive in this new uh, sort of economic system? So with that as a sort of big, contextual overview. I'm going to uh, go down the line and have everybody introduce themselves. And again, please sort of state what you think is the big issue that needs to be solved, and then we'll get into the real set of questions. Jeremy. Hi, I'm Jeremy Landis, uh, founder of Kincaid. We're a software experience and design firm. Um, we do a lot of development in the TV and media space. Um, some of our clients are you know, Comcast, Showtime, um, and in the OTT space, Gaia. Um, in a past life, I actually was at Comcast in the early days whenever the internet side was about 12 of us. And it was in Comcast.net days and the fan and early streaming. So long history in, in this realm and seeing OTT coming for a long time. Um, you know, I think that one of the biggest challenges we're going to have in, in, in OTT space overall and what will drive monetization, the winners will be the ones that give the best overall user experience. And that's going to touch a lot of places. That's going to touch the interface. It's going to touch the streaming and delivery service. But it's also going to be ads and some other things that we'll, we'll touch on today. But I think it's the user experience that's really going to drive it. Great. Um, my name is Doug Parrish. I'm the president of RR Media. We're a global media services company, mostly focused on uh, broadcast, channel origination, uh, content preparation services, and kind of the front end of uh, a lot of the things that we see in the online environment. Former life, I ran Ascent Media Group, uh, Move Networks, and was the CTO of the Walt Disney Company, responsible for digital new media and the internet business. And uh, so I've done both the traditional and the new media side of, of this equation. Um, you know, my perspective is there's a whole lot of things that need to be solved, but for purposes of at least a preamble, one of the things I think needs to be taken care of is what I would call the gravity or friction around rights and how all those things happen. To me, it's a physics problem. You know, you have to have a certain amount of friction or we wouldn't be able to even, you know, walk around or things like that. Uh, but we can't have so much friction that we have our shoes stuck to the floor. And so we need to figure those kinds of things out. We'll touch a little bit more on that later. 
I'm Scott Rosenberg. I lead the New York office for Roku, and I, I run our ad business. I also write lots of content deals, uh, distribution deals for our platform. Um, my team and I are, are focused on something that I think is, uh, you know, one of the more interesting uh, issues facing OTT, opportunities facing OTT. Our, our job is to help content providers like, like David's company get audience and then monetize that audience. We're, you know, in the second or third phase of the OTT evolution. Uh, it's increasingly becoming a scale game. Uh, you know, can you help a publisher acquire critical mass audience? Can you equip them with the tools uh, to monetize effectively, whether that's marketing subscriptions or transactions or, or ad-supported uh, views? So that, that's our focus uh, on my team and I think uh, very much the most interesting uh, area in OTT right now. Uh, I'm David Fannin. I'm the Executive Vice President of Screen Media Ventures. Uh, we launched a VOD ad-supported movie platform called Popcorn Flicks in 2011. Um, when the demise of the DVD started, we looked to the OTT space as the new frontier. And I think we were correct about that. But the biggest um, difficulty we're facing right now is that the ad model is not caught up with, with the the use today. So right now, advertisers are still not gravitating towards OTT as much as I'd like them to be. So that's, that's what we're focusing on. I think Scott is helping in that area and what Roku is doing. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind of the new frontier for that. So David, let's uh, pick up on that. And this applies to the whole panel. Uh, ad monetization models, AVOD, SVOD, subscription, TVOD, transactional, hybrid, you know, uh, as was said on the previous panel, Glenn Beck, 300 to 400 uh, subscribers in an advertising universe, that would never work. It wouldn't work in a cable uni uh, uh, broadcast or a cable universe. How is this going to sort of play out? And how does this become sustainable? And then you've got, you know, the MCNs on the other sort of uh, side of the equation. Well, I don't think the... We got to see how it's going to play out. I, I think there's always going to sp be space for free content, and that's why the ad model will work. Um, the SVOD model, you see, what I find is really interesting in the space I'm in, you know, every other week there's a new announcement of someone doing an SVOD model, which I'm happy about. I'm like, please go ahead, take the SVOD model. I want the AVOD model right now. Um, so I think it'll become oversaturated. I mean, you know, what's HBO now charging? $19. Uh, that's a significant amount of money for this platform. You've got Netflix, you'll have Showtime. They're all going to be charging. And I think the, when ESPN gets in there, I don't even know what they're going to charge. Uh, so the free model is always going to be available. I think the SVOD model may become oversaturated at some point, and it'll become less and less. But Glenn Beck fans are always going to be Glenn Beck fans, and they're always going to they're going to pay top dollar for that. So if you nail that niche audience that you need, the the SVOD model will work for that, as long as you don't expect to be everything to everybody. And do, do you think that you'll be able to get the numbers that it requires to drive at least <coughs> in historical revenue uh, sort of equations around an advertising model? Well, right now, the numbers are significant. Uh, and you know, right, the last report I've read that we haven't even hit 30% of households having some kind of OTT device in. So I think, you know, in two years, when you start having 200 million with OTT devices and there's going to be three or four in a house, I think that, that is going to support the model. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what the growth is. It's like the Wild West right now. Okay, Scott, you, you've done a phenomenal job of getting Roku in practically everywhere and uh, building out sort of channels. Uh, but as you sort of look at this monetization sort of problem, uh, how do you uh, achieve that in what is essentially a medium where people can jump from one uh, sort of experience to another and aren't used to uh, having being sort of captive and having this sort of interactive model that we all sort of grew up with? Well, I don't think they're jumping from device to device. You know, when we get a Roku user, we, we generally keep them and we sell a second and third device into them. I think you know, we are headed into a world where there are thousands of channels for a user. To, to, another zero on top of the, or two zeros on top of the channel count you could get through your MVPT. 
Um, but I think the physics are changing too. I mean, uh, you know, David was talking about these smaller SVOD services. These guys don't need to do millions of subscribers for their business model to work, right? It, the, the costs of distribution, the content that they're licensing, many of them would be very uh, happy, very successful with tens or low hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Um, and and on, on a platform like ours, that's, that's tenable, right? The, the, the cost, the infrastructure necessary to deploy that, uh, su support that. Um, you know, in the old world, you'd have to go try, try and strike affiliate deals with every major cable operator. On the ad-supported segment, I agree with David. It's, uh, you know, if you sort of think of the OTT in uh, waves of business models, sort of the, the first wave was the Netflix, you know, large aggregator SVOD business model. And we had Amazon and Hulu come in behind that. And then transactional services have been a big growth category for us. The ad-supported segment is basically the youngest, I, I consider it to be the youngest of the segments in terms of its maturity in OTT. Um, the model is different. I think a lot of uh, publishers are still trying to build the scale necessary to run a direct sales team. Uh, the, some of the plumbing that they would need to sell successfully is not there yet. We, we announced last week a, a, a deal with, uh, with Nielsen to enable digital ad ratings on Roku. It's the first, uh, first OTT platform to solve that problem. Um, and that's part of an investment we're making as a platform to try and make for better monetization. We've also uh, integrated uh, interactive ad tech into our core uh, platform. We did a partnership with Innovid to enable that. So we're working at the platform level to try and help ad-supported uh, business models uh, sell better. Uh, so there's scale, there's capability, and then there's market awareness. I mean, I think the, uh, the, the marketers of today, the agencies, um, are waking up to uh, the importance of following the cord cutter, the cord shaver, the cord never. -er. And those numbers for the first time in the last few quarters are showing up as very real declines in subscription, uh, subscriptions to pay TV services, uh, double digit declines in ratings uh, across most networks. So you have a, a, a growing but still early stage awareness among marketers that they've got to follow viewers into the uh, connected TV uh, world. Uh, so you deal a lot with the uh, content prep and uh, putting the metadata around that and making sure that the rights are being sort of handled effectively. As you look at it from your sort of perspective of going from the big sort of broadcasty MSO world to a much more sort of agile uh, IP world, I mean, it, are we ready for that? You know, you've heard all the nightmares of you know performance problems, and you're essentially going from a broadcast to you know a unicast model. Um, you know more about the infrastructure than most people. Is it, are we going to be successful there? Well, I think uh, all, all of these things are evolving in, in, in a variety of ways, and, and we talk about the different models. You know, AVOD, SVOD, TVOD, free to air, all of those things. I mean, my perspective is those are all going to exist and exist simultaneously. The, the problem we're going to run into is there's going to be a certain amount of, of force that's required. Um, you know, people would, would, would uh, people are going to object, if you may, to, uh, to an enormous number of SVOD uh, services. You know, I mean, you pay $19 for HBO, you know, as, as uh, Scott pointed out, uh, you know, ESPN or, uh, you know, Netflix and all of these other things. Pretty soon you look at your credit card bill at the end of the month and you go, you know, I can't afford all these things. And so I think there's going to be roles for aggregators to deal with those kinds of issues and subscription bundling, especially for the lower value channels and things like that. Uh, there's no doubt about the fact that somebody will say, look, I've got this set of things that I would like to watch that are my particular interest, and I'm willing to pay the premium subscriptions for that because there'll be a bunch of value add things that go along with that, you know, access to premium content or events or things like that that you normally wouldn't have access to if you were a, a, uh, a, a not premium frequent flyer. Let's use that as, a, as an example. So I, I think that there's, there's issues there around how all of those different uh, pieces come together. And, you know, I think the second part that's related to that is really around the devices and the technology and how all that comes together. 
you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer of the fact that the, that the regular mainstream viewer isn't going to be interested in having multiple set-top boxes connected up to a, uh, uh, to a screen in some way. It's confusing, uh, y you know, unless you go out and, and, and deliberately program your home for those kinds of things, yes, those things exist, but, uh, you know, most people have 14 different uh, remote controls and they're trying to figure all of these things out. And so, um, you know, we, we need to figure also out how to deliver a service that, that is uh, something that people are used to. It's one of the things they like about a single set-top box and a cable platform and things like that is, you know, the user interface, uh, in some cases badly formed, but, you know, we all know who those guys are. And uh, uh, in others, they, they're, they're done fairly well and people are used to those kind of guides. So I think those are issues that have to be solved. Uh, as, as much as uh, the, the um, you know, the issue of is it all going to be subscription transactional or ad based. So that's a great transition to Jeremy because ultimately it's about the consumer experience, right. the UX, but let me sort of twist this slightly. <coughs> we have customers who have SVOD, AVOD, TVOD things all within the same user experience and uh, is, you know, having a user experience which sort of adapts to what your particular sort of uh, value proposition uh, is, is that the way to go or do you need to sort of create a really simplified Netflix-like one subscription kind of thing uh, and another straightforward ad thing or, you know, can they coexist? That's a big question. Um, yeah, so so a couple things, um, you know, I think in the world of, of OTT aggregators, um, one, of the, one of the things you might see happen in ads is as people start to aggregate, then you don't worry about, you know, like cable is today, you don't worry about that this channel only has X amount of subscribers, you can start to sell ads across that aggregated network of, of channels. Um, yeah, to your, to your question, um, you know, we've, we've been doing a lot of work and, and doing a lot of research around what is the best experience. So there's Apple TV and OTT where all the apps look the same, the navigation's the same, it's forced down one route, the content goes in and whether you're in the, you know, FX or HBO or UFC or any other app, you know how to navigate it and it's the same versus a Roku or Fire TV where you have complete control over your app. So if I want to go in and watch something in HBO, my experience is completely different than going in and watching something on Gaia and going in and watching something on FX. Um, so, so I think that there's a lot of consumer confusion there about how to, you know, what, what application they're in and how to access the content that they're getting to. So if you look at something like Sling TV and starting to create a service where you're aggregating all this content and all these channels into one thing, you start to create that opportunity. Cable's always had that opportunity. They've had varying degrees of success on actually executing the user experience around accessing all this content, being able to browse and find. And you're seeing some of those barriers come down. You know, it used to be that on-demand menus were extremely segmented and, and you know, it was all based on the marketing team said that, you know, this channel couldn't be beside this channel, beside this. So you'd go to movies and it'd be all over the place. They're starting to aggregate that so you go to one place and you can see movies and see it across these different places. So. Um, so to your question about can all these things coexist, I think that they, they, yes, they can coexist and they will coexist and there's going to be clear paths inside of each of these services whenever you're, whenever you're in either a sling which is aggregating a, a bunch of different channels and content and maybe that or another service starts to enforce their own UI guidelines to make it simpler or you're going to HBO now because that's a premium service that's separate. I think both will exist in this future world. I think one of the, I think one of the most exciting things in the OTT space right now, just to piggyback on uh, on Jeremy's comment, is uh, programmers are becoming programmers, mm -hmm. and, and by that I mean software developers. Uh, uh, sounds very Yoga Yogi Berra esque, I suppose. But I mean, you know, I think that we interact with thousands of of uh, publishers, programmers app developers, whatever term you want to use, and they're all at various stages of recognition that they're in the software development UX space. Some sort of just don't, don't want to accept it and don't want to acknowledge that it has a profound impact on their ability to get, keep, and grow their audience, and some of them are all the way on the other end of the spectrum, like a Netflix, very sophisticated, A-B testing, how they present content and organize their experience, constantly optimizing, 
And I'm, I'm not suggesting that every programmer will end up at that far end of the spectrum or necessarily needs to, but there's definitely a new discipline emerging in the space where a programmer has the opportunity to go right to that last piece of glass and provide a unique and branded uh, experience to the user. And those who do that well and think about that and recognize that that's a core part of their business will have a better chance of winning than those who don't. Yeah, I think what Scott's saying, too, in terms of programmers becoming programmers, I mean, some of the highest paid network executives, you know, over time were the, 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 the programming guys, the people who would set up Thursday night lineup and say, here's what we're going to have in terms of uh, the different content. So from my perspective, channels still matter in some way. And it's not just a user experience, but it's also content that gets threaded together in terms of what follows on. You know, for those of you who do binge watching, it's very easy to say, well, gee, what should follow episode three of season three of House of Cards should be episode four. That's a no-brainer. But to be able to take the diverse library and universe of content and figure out what gets stitched behind all of these and create you know, personalized virtual channels and things like that. And it's not all going to be artificial intelligence and, right. and software. There's going to be you know, human thought that goes into that and, and, and figure those things out. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I agree with all of it. It's funny, Scott and I were just talking about what we need to do to update our app. And, uh, you know, to follow up on that point is, you know, we're programmers and, for example, I started this uh, platform with about a thousand movies. We had a film library that we could start. And to get into this space without owning content is very difficult. But now I've got to get the user experience and how is the user going to watch it. You know, it's important to have a flow of movies, but it's also technologically important to be able to have the consumer to get that flow delivered directly to them seamlessly. You're watching this the next one's got to pop right up. I mean, if you want to get the binge watcher, you got to make it easy for them. And that's where the technology side fits in. It's, it's a really interesting marriage. And, you know, for an old uh, programming A&E television networks guy, it's, it's, it's every day is a new challenge of what we're doing and looking at numbers and where does this fit in the slider? What's going to follow this? How, how are my consumers going to reach this? Who likes this? And, you know, it changes from day to day what people are watching, you know. So it's... <laughs> I, you know, I wish I had all the answers. It just, I just so, don't right now. So, so is it a, so we've got the sort of top-down approach, old pro cr programming, we think we know what people want to sort of watch kind of sort of mentality, and then we've got the programmatic, uh, bottoms-up um, sort of algorithms driving personalization and recommendations. Uh, but I believe there's room for both. I, I really do. I do. I, it's funny. I, I always say so, I, consumers to a lot of us in TV watchers are somewhat lazy. You know, I want to turn something on and just watch something. Yeah. I come home at night, I just, I don't want to think. I don't want to go through a list. I don't want to try to pick what I'm going to choose. I sometimes wouldn't mind. So I think the linear version mm -hmm. of, and I think that's the next kind of thing to develop in the OTT space, is to mm -hmm. have a linear channel where something is just playing. Now, it can be ad supported or not, but I just don't have to choose it. I can flip on popcorn flicks and I can just mm -hmm. watch a movie. And I'll catch it in the middle, it doesn't matter. I, you know. Kids are yelling, I can just hide right now and just watch something. And as you think about your ad model specifically, do you think there's ever the opportunity to use an ad model more as a sort of freemium upsell to a sustainable subscription model? You've watched, you know, you're learning about that user, they've watched, you know, X number of on that. It's funny, channel. we have an argument about this all the time. You well, know, that's uh, is that is sure there gonna do. be does the consumer say, you know what? fine, you'll charge me this, but it's free. You can't, it's hard to compete with free, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I would like to kind of develop that further. And we've done some experiments uh, with Roku where we charge a consumer, you can watch it 99 cents without ads or with ads. And that's lukewarm. I think at the end of the day, a consumer sees free. Lukewarm meaning the vast majority take the ad Take, take the free. Rather take the free. than fund the 99 cents. Fund the 99 cents. cents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's surprising still people do it, but again, it's just, it's free. I think we'll always win out. Okay. When they're side by side. Now, I think if Netflix started with a free model and a subscription model, it, it would be kind of different. Yeah, I don't know if their subscription model would be the same today. I just think I can't, I can't have popcorn flicks charging and the free one. I think people will always revert to the free one. Now I can start a new channel. It's a little different and order something differently. I believe that's there. Yeah, and again, I, I haven't done this yet, so I'm really just, yeah, you know. I, I guess I'm sort of 
sitting here wondering if that's reflective of your content and who your audience is and if you could have multiple audiences and for instance a young audience that gets an advertising stream because they uh, have lots of time and not much money versus you know somebody paying for convenience or you know mm -hmm. particular sort of fan base mm -hmm. in the sort of Glenn Beck model and whether or not again coming back to the question can those be uh, supported within a single system. Don't yeah, I think too that it's also predicated on the content itself. You know, I mean, we've all had the experience of, of the two things I'm going to describe. First of all is of content that's had all the ads compressed out and you get to that interesting crescendo where it fades to black and then it immediately goes to another scene and you're kind of expecting an ad to be inserted there as kind of a breather for you to kind of contemplate what that uh, particular act of the of the show was and we've also had the inverse which is a, a show that goes to a place where then an ad's suddenly there and you go where did this come from because the storyline didn't include that and so one of the things I believe happens over time is that the content adapts itself to this or the story writers and the content creators figure out how to deal with that. And I think, you know, to your point about these different models, uh, you know, content that doesn't have these, these normal breaks put into it will be more uh, likely to appear in a lot of these SVOD kinds of, of places. And the, and the AVOD, you know, there'll be content designed for those things as well. Uh, let me uh, shift slightly here. I mean, uh, I saw an interesting graphic actually last night which sort of showed the evolution of, um, t in this case, Fox Television Network from an OVP play, sorry again for the acronyms, online video platform to an OTT play to now more of a sort of personalized TV play if you want. Uh, you know, do you think that that is, and this applies to everybody, the sort of natural progression as you go from online ad supporting to OTT, which tend to be more transactional and subscription, to building in of technology, which has more personalization and recommendation, or are there other sort of evolutions? I mean, if people here are trying to sort of figure out how to spin up their own OTT things and make it actually sustainable, and I know at least a few people in the audience who are, what would be your advice in sort of what's the evolution? Where, what would they have to do today in order to uh, do that, and I'll start with, you know, is it around A-B testing and experimentation? What is it, uh, Jeremy? Yeah, so, it's my mic on. Um, sorry, just thinking. Yeah, so I, I think that if someone were starting out right now, I, I don't know that it's an out, the, all the things you mentioned to me are, are one thing, like whether it's, you know, the, the video platform powers the OTT solution, and knowing the different components. So there's the user experience component, there's the content component, there's the platform component. And I mean, all those things feed into the user experience. So whenever I click start, how does it go? We were also talking a lot about ads and to touch on that a little bit more from previous, you know, part of the problem with ads online is it's just largely ineffective, right? You see the same ad over and over several times. Um, you see, you know, you, there's, I think there's some ad abuse with some injections going in, like um, I was watching The Comedians, at the new Billy Crystal show, and in between the intro and the first scene, they injected a commercial. And it just feels like it's a little bit too much, like it's being forced instead of feeling like a natural flow, like you were mentioning. There's this thing, and I need a break, and I get an ad, and that's my expectation as a consumer. So, you know, going back to, you know, what you need to do right is, you need to know what type of company you are. Are you a technology company? This, this talks a little bit to the programmers as programmers as well. So if you are a content company, and I'll kind of frame this in, we, we do work with Guy TV that does OTT, um, and it's all health and wellness content. And they, they've done a great job where they knew who they were, and they were a content company. So they've always outsourced their vendor and their platforms, their ads. They do all those things, and they focus on the content. And they started with, what they thought was going to be a small fan club of a couple hundred people, it ended up being a couple thousand people, up to a hundred thousand people, and you know they've done a really good job just focusing on what they need to do. Um, so, so the experience piece they've they've outsourced us, thankfully. Um, the platform that's underneath is powering all the video, and they're 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 really focused. So, um, whenever you go back to programmers, programmers. The issue that I see is people can't do everything well, so they need to know what it is they need to do well for their company to be a success. 
And as a video provider, content provider, you know, it's, it's really the content. And then looking at what partners can help you get to the consumer and give you the best pieces and the best experience to deliver that. Yeah, sometimes the best decision is to outsource something, right? If, but you have to start by recognizing, hey, the user experience is important. I need somebody like Jeremy's company to help me with that. Uh, we, we work with the guy and team quite a bit, and they're, they're, they're pretty innovative in terms of thinking about not just the user experience, but how to market. I mean, that's another competency for the next generation programmers. How do you market in this new ecosystem? You used to just market it by, by piggybacking one show on top of the, the show in the hour prior. Right. The, the competency, the tools you use, the metrics you look at are, are quite different and evolving quickly. And so the Gaim team is pretty uh, innovative in that regard. Yeah. I think marketing is a critical aspect that yeah. media companies need to actually take a lesson out of <laughs> what a lot of marketing companies have known for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Doug? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, you, the, the question really revolves around advice. And, you know, I, I think what has to happen is people have to look at this from a very holistic perspective. I don't think that any one of these models are necessarily going to uh, to supplant uh, the other. We still have free TV today. We've got, uh, you know, cable subscriptions and all of this uh, on, online and over the top things uh, that, that are happening. But, uh, you know, for, for companies who are already uh, uh, flying broadcast channels today, there's an opportunity to, you know, turn those into uh, to, to online channels. Uh, there's an opportunity to cross market on all of these different spaces. Um, a good example of this is back in 2006, when we launched ABC.com, which was all of the catch-up episodes uh, at, at that point in time. And I remember sitting down with the programming executives and saying, look, you know, what we want is this 15-second uh, call-out at the end of, you know, let's see, Lost was one of the big uh, uh, episodic uh, programs at that time. We, we want a 15-second call-out at the end of Lost. And we were told to get lost. Sorry for the bad joke. But uh, we were told to, to go away because they weren't going to uh, to use that 15 seconds of possible uh, promotional or uh, advertising uh, airtime in order to promote somebody back to go to an online experience. Now, admittedly, that's eight years ago, but uh, I think all of these pieces exist and they need to be moving viewers from one to the other, especially because we already talk a lot about this not being just 10 foot experience sitting on the sofa, but I've got, you know, this that I'm uh, watching in the uh, uh, in the train or the subway or, or wherever. And so those are I different experiences as well. They should all drive me back to a variety of other things. David? Uh, uh, well, it's yeah. funny. You spoke about early on about the, the flow from the web. I mean, we started with a web-based property. And when we first started in 2011, you couldn't get video ads on the web. It was all banner advertisement, and we were started there. And then, you know, now everybody's used to watching video ads on the web. I mean, now I look at a news feed, and it starts with a video ad every time. And, you know, three years ago, people were saying, no one's going to watch ads on the web. And now that's where we're at. Now we're at OTT. We're trying to go to what's going to happen there with the advertising. And I think Scott's right on it. What Roku's doing with Nielsen is just, it's really going to change the whole landscape of what's happening there. Uh, and you know we're working on new technology right now from the mobile phone. Now my mobile phone is going to become a remote control. You know I'm, I've got a technology we're developing right now. I will have it on my phone, and you're watching popcorn flicks. You're going to go into your house, and it'll say, "You have a Roku device. Would you like to watch this on the Roku device?" And if popcorn flicks isn't even downloaded on the Roku device, it will ask me if I want to download it on the Roku device. So. Yeah. So then it's become a, a mobile-based property, and everything's coming from our phones. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, where we're going the next two years. I, I the advice to say to what they're what people are going to do for this space, I'm not sure how to how to direct anybody because it's just it's changing so rapidly. So, 30 seconds, very quickly, you know, for this audience, what's the sort of big take up takeaway for each of you, and then we'll sort of throw it out open for some questions. So, if there are any questions out there, get them ready. Uh, uh, so I think the takeaway for, for this year, I think we're going to see maybe by end of year in the next year, five to ten major aggregators following the lines of Sling starting to aggregate, starting to ag uh, microphone keeps on coming on and off, sorry, starting to aggregate this content and offer it in dynamic bundling so that you're only paying for the channels that you want. And whenever, you know, I, I think the, the big movement is going to be that reduction of friction. 
And one of our favorite examples of that is actually um, the Amazon Fire TV whenever it first came out. And I took the stick and I plugged it in and it knew who I was and gave me all my content without ever logging in. You know, that type of friction reduction is what consumers are going to expect because right now Comcast gives them a box and they turn it on and it, it starts playing and that, that's what they see. But, but you know, I think so, you know, these, these aggregators and the goal of reducing that friction of I don't have to log into FX, log into HBO and deal with the Showtime TV Everywhere experience. I log in one place and I get access to the content I want. Frictionless TV? Um, I think it's, a con it, it's content, so uh, it'll continue to evolve as the technology enables it. Uh, the way I describe it is like this, you know, the first mass medium really was print and uh, newspaper particularly when radio was, uh, was available, the first radio programs were guys reading the newspaper on the radio. And uh, then radio evolved into content that was, that was fitted for that technology and format. And then the first television programs were what? Radio melodramas on television. You could see the Foley artists in the back doing their, uh, their uh, sound effects and everything else. And then television evolved to embrace you know, the, the capability, the full capability of its medium. Uh, we've seen this before. And what we're in right now, I think, is in a place where the content's going to evolve to embrace these different platforms. We're just in that weird pubescent stage right now. Uh, I agree with Jeremy. I think that uh, bundling and uh, virtual pay TV services are going to be a big trend over the next couple of years. I think this, uh, initiatives like the Sling, Sling TV uh, strategy, we'll see more of those. And I think they're really changing the way consumers think about TV and the way programmers think about you know, what uh, bundling they want to be part of. And I think we're going to see a real maturation of the, the ad-supported segment in OTT over the next year or two. I, yeah, no, and I, I, I agree with both. Last it's funny, week. I read an article today about uh, Dish, that they've lost 135,000 subscribers, but they're not giving the numbers on what Sling TV is doing, and they're devoting more and more of their resources to Sling TV. I think aggregation is going to be key, and I, I think the overall key is that we're going to see more and more people go to the OTT, whether it's Amazon Fire, Roku, they're going to leave cable behind. And cable's going to be fine because they have the pipe into the home for the most part. Uh, so you don't have to worry about them. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that's going to be the big takeaway. I mean, right now, what did I say? It's about 3 in 10 have an OTT device. I, I think that'll be at 50% by the end of the year. And I, I think it's going to move much faster than other things have in the past. Uh, and I think in two years, this is really going to be a mature, mature business. Yeah. That one point about you know cable companies are going to be okay is so critical compared to Dish. I mean, you know, when you, when we talk about cord cutters, they're not cutting the cord. No, they got broadband into the home. It's just you're mm -hmm. seeing pay TV evolving to. And then the concern will be just yeah. to throw that out there for people to think about is what who's going to control that pipe and how much they're going to charge for that and get a net neutrality and you know that's going to be a that's real a, that's interesting. That's another panel. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, do we have any questions? And I'll repeat them so the microphones pick them up. Um, so Jeremy mentioned Sling first. You know, I think Charlie Ergen knew he was going to cannibalize his own um, consumers when he did that. Do you think that programmers and those of us who create content need to just start making friends with the Slings of the world? Because I do think you're right on. People want one bill to pay. They want one source to go to. So do we visit Scott? Talk about I was with you right until you said you only want one bill. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> two or three, maybe. And where are you, where uh, so are you let me from? just repeat the question. So uh, with Dish TV being very d disruptive, not only to the industry, but to their own uh, sort of fundamental uh, business, uh, what is a content uh, owner to do? Where do they go uh, to basically get their content distributed to uh, end users? Uh, does it have to be a one-stop shop or is there another way that this is going to play out and work? I, th I think bundling is only headed in one direction, which is more diversity, mm -hmm. more price points, more choice. Right. And, uh, you know, you, depending on the kind of programmer you are, you, you, the urgency for you to start working those deals is different. Uh, but if you're serving a demo that's younger, uh, if, you know, and, and observing double-digit ratings drops, mm -hmm. you ought to be thinking about it faster than 
uh, programmers who, whose audiences are moving more slowly. Can I add to that, Tim? I think that uh, you, know, you do that already today. You know, you're, you're visiting all of the major distributors as a, as a channel operator and saying, I need to be on Dish, I need to be on DirecTV, I need to be on Verizon, I need to be on you know, all of the cable platforms. The reason we don't have an enormous choice today is mostly because those cable plants are public utilities and regulated in some fashion so that everybody isn't digging up the street all the time. Uh, <coughs> now I think we're just going to see more and more of these guys emerge. And uh, so I would be courting everybody right now. <laughs> the, uh, the dance isn't over yet. <laughs> Question back there? Uh, the question is, how do CPMs compare for OTT versus uh, traditional linear programming? David? Uh, <laughs> they're, they're quite high, in fact. Actually, yeah, they're, they're, they're quite high. And in fact, actually, it's funny, even on the web, uh, they're higher than uh, what they're getting on TV. And yeah, they're right. growing. And I mean, now with like Innovid and other companies like that, where we can have interactive ads on OTT, it's going to be, it's a game changer. Yeah. So yeah. David Poltrak, who's the guru of all research at CBS for eons, uh, is very bullish on uh, video on demand because uh, you can control the CPM and the user experience much more. And again, it comes down to that targeting sort of issue which we talked about. If you can you know, actually reach the right audience, then you can drive a much better and provable uh, CPM. Interactive ads, where do you go? I'm not really following your question, I'm sorry. I've, you know, interactive ads, there's two companies right now that we're dealing with uh, that are building in SDKs into our platform for certain platforms. And so now with your remote control, for example, your Roku remote control, you're gonna be able to stop an ad and really get into it and watch more of that ad. I think that's where advertisers are going to go. I mean, this is, this is now they've got the consumer you know, able to interact with their ads, to buy something immediately. Now, the next extension is going to be to the phone because there's all this dual screen mentality that's going on. So I'm going to have an ad, and Popcorn Flicks is going to be showing a movie, and an ad for soap is going to come up or whatever, a car. And they're going to have that on their phone at the same time, and they're going to be able to do some kind of interaction on their phone with that ad why it's still playing up on their device, on the OTT device. And this is, I think, an advertiser's dream scenario. I don't think that it opens the door, the floodgates are open to a lot of different unique things and much higher CPMs. And geo-based. Oh, yeah, I mean, geo-based is there already now. I mean, it's, it's amazing what I can do with the system we have in place. Yep. Uh, sorry, Sarah over on the left. Yeah, so let me repeat the question. Uh, how does that re relate to consumer uh, fan clubs and things? So Overstock has just announced that they're, not just announced earlier this year, um, an OTT plan uh, mm -hmm. to basically use their uh, vast audience and not only their audience, but their fan club to basically um, produce an OTT sort of product. So um, you know, how do those things uh, Doug, do you have a view on that? So. Well, I don't. I, I, I don't think that. Uh, I, I don't think it evolves away from the things that we see today. You know, QVC, Home Shopping Network, all of those things were uh, were built on the back of specialized kind of, of programming, and uh, I think we're just going to see more and more of those. Any other? Qu we're actually over time, but we were given permission to go a bit long. But <laughs> if you want to go to lunch. <laughs> and we should uh, uh, break soon. Back in the back, two more questions. Yeah, so, so as we see so the massive revenue is moving from right now what is essentially a one way, one to many linear pipe into an environment which is two way, interactive, trackable. Uh, we talked about a little bit about ad innovation. What other innovations do you guys see? Is there anything that's happening right now? Um, the barriers, for example, the cost of distributing the content is being lowered. The ROI Mm-hmm. 
uh, what other innovations are there in terms of monetization? I'm sort of generalizing the uh, question, apologies. Uh, I'll just throw in uh, DAI, uh, dynamic ad insertion, which allows you to do programmatic um, ads at a personalized sort of level. But, you know, other people? I mean, I, I, I think it's a really fun time to be in TV because there's innovation up and down the, the food chain. I mean, you know, everything from the business model that, that folks approach us with, um, you know, not a week goes by where we don't see some new and slightly different configuration of how they're going to monetize. The, we've talked about the user experience. We've talked about bundling. We've talked about marketing. I mean, really, on our platform, over well over 2,000 apps, we just we see innovation at every step of that process. And it's hard uh, if you're building a new business to sort of put those pieces together. You'd be surprised the number of very senior people that approach our platform and say, well, should I do an ad supported business model or a subscription business model? Or like, you need to decide that on your own. <laughs> but here's, here's what we know. Uh, you know. We're able to advise in that regard. But you know, these are complex pieces, all of which are moving at the same time. Yeah, that's a very good point. Know your business, as Doug was sort of saying earlier, and Jeremy, and then experiment with these different sort of models and try and find something that works for you. One last question, if there is one. Okay, there isn't. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, ho hopefully that was useful. <laughs>